Welcome, everyone. This is um, a hearing of the Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming. We welcome you all to this very important hearing today. Over the course of the past year, the Select Committee has investigated numerous impacts of global warming, from the melting of the Greenland ice cap to the drying out of the Amazon rainforest to the sliding of Alaskan villages into the sea. But the impacts on land are only the tip of the melting iceberg of a potential climate catastrophe. Oceans cover 70 percent of our planet, and they are also feeling the heat of global warming. Throughout Earth's history, the ocean and the atmosphere have worked together to regulate the climate. The ocean serves as a sponge, soaking up excess carbon and heat from the air above it. Carbon dioxide dissolves in seawater where plants and animals of all shapes and sizes convert it into their own protective coverings. Although many of these creatures are too small to see with the naked eye, the result of their work can be monumental as witnessed by the white cliffs of Dover and the ancient reefs that are now the mountains of West Texas. But the burning of fossil fuels has released increasing amounts of ancient carbon back into the atmosphere, and the oceans are overworked. During the past 40 years, the ocean has absorbed 90 percent of the estimated increase in the Earth's heat content from human activities. Like sweeping dirt under the rug, the oceans have protected us from feeling the full heat of global warming pollution. While many of the ocean changes may be out of our sight, we must not put them out of our mind. Global warming is causing an underwater heat wave, and the rise in ocean temperature impacts sea life at all depths. Many marine species thrive in only a narrow temperature range, and this heat stress forces them to move away from their traditional feeding and breeding areas in search of cooler waters. But not all marine life can simply shift with changing sea temperatures. Coral reefs have nowhere to go when the water around them heats up. Instead, they expel their life-giving, colorful algae. Once reefs experience such a bleaching episode, they often never recover. Warmer oceans pose another threat, rising sea level. As water heats up, it expands. During the last 40 years, this expansion has contributed to 25 percent of the observed sea level rise. Rising sea levels already cause harm in coastal communities around the world, increasing their vulnerability to storms and threatening their drinking water. As global temperatures continue to rise, so too will sea levels, reshaping the contours of the world's coasts. Impacts on the ocean go beyond warmer waters. The rising carbon dioxide concentration in the air alters the fundamental chemistry of the ocean. As seawater absorbs more and more CO2, the water becomes relatively more acidic. This ocean acidification can prevent coral reefs from growing stop shellfish from developing their protective outer layer, and inhibit the growth of tiny shell-forming plants and animals that form the foundation of much of the ocean food chain. The oceans have been taking on the burden of the planet's fever. Recent evidence suggests that oceans are losing their efficiency as a sink for the carbon we emit. If we reduce the ocean's ability to help us handle the global warming burden, we may face the impacts of global warming sooner than predicted. Today we hear from some of the world's foremost ocean researchers. They have seen firsthand many impacts from global warming that those of us above the surface will never see. Their testimonies will convey the consequences of our out-of-sight, out-of-mind strategy. Like an iceberg, most of the problem lies beneath the surface of the ocean. What lurks below holds serious consequences, and if we refuse to change course, we will run into a problem far larger than it first appeared. At this hearing, we will demonstrate through our witnesses that we need a sea change in our energy and climate policy if we want to avoid an actual catastrophic change in our seas. And now I would like to turn and recognize 
uh, the ranking member, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the topic of today's hearing is yet another reason why I believe technological development is one of the most crucial steps in the effort to confront global warming. Rising CO2 levels and increasing temperatures will have an impact on the oceans. Some prospects are unnerving, like the dying of the coral reefs. Others can be approached through adaptations such as a rise in the sea levels. Energy is the lifeblood of our economy. Right now, much of the energy is generated creates CO2. But there already exist some technologies that generate en energy without emitting CO2 into the atmosphere. And if Congress acts wisely, there could be more on the way. One of these technologies is nuclear power, which generates great amounts of energy without producing any CO2 whatsoever. Another technology that is on the horizon is carbon capture and storage, which has the potential to allow the U.S. to continue to use our vast coal reserves to generate energy, but with only a fraction of the CO2 emissions. Renewable energy technologies and gains in energy efficiency also stand to reduce carbon dioxide emissions, and we should strive to achieve all of these key technological improvements. Nuclear power and carbon capture and storage are technologies that not only would go a long way toward reducing CO2 emissions, but they will also help ensure the energy security of the United States. And if the U.S. can't be secure in its energy supply, it certainly can't be secure in its economy. These days, anyone pumping gas into their car knows this. That's why I don't support the array of policy proposals that unwisely seek to tax away carbon dioxide. This won't work, and it will slow the economy, and eventually will end up being repealed. The production of CO2 through energy production is a factor in global warming, but it's not the only factor. There are many natural sources of CO2 that are emitted into the atmosphere. There are still some scientific questions about how large a role humans play in global warming. It raises some questions as to how much humans can do to stop these changes in the oceans and in the atmosphere. Even if by some divine intervention humans were able to completely stop emitting CO2 tomorrow, some of these changes would still occur. Therefore, in some cases, adaptation will be the only reasonable choice, and that is something that people all over the world need to be ready to handle. The witnesses today will present very interesting and well-researched testimony on the scientific topic, which I'm sure will not only help educate all of us, but will also help to strengthen my belief in the need for the development and advancement of energy technology. I thank the Chair. The, gentle the gentleman's time has expired. We'll now turn to our witnesses. Our first witness is uh, Dr. Sylvia Earle. Explorer in Residence for the National Geographic Society. For decades, Dr. Earl has set herself apart as a world-renowned oceanographer, a pioneering explorer, and as the first female chief scientist of the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Her incredible work uh, understanding and protecting our oceans in more than 7,000 hours conducting underwater research have earned her the title, Her Deepness. She has been named a living legend by the Library of Congress and a hero for the planet by Time magazine. Uh, we welcome you, Dr. Earl. Uh, whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Representative Markey, for hosting us here, all of you. We were asked, those of us who have been invited to comment, to address several questions. And let me start with that. The first was, climate changes that we have personally observed. As one who splashes around in the oceans of the world as often as possible for a number of years, I have witnessed changes in the natural systems uh, greatly changed over the period of time since I was a child. And projecting forward, if the pace of change continues, our children are not going to have much in the way of stable ecosystems in their future. Degraded systems are more vulnerable to climate change or any other factors, storms or diseases. And what we have caused in the last half century through our actions, what we put into the sea, what we take out of the ocean, is causing profound changes in the nature of the ocean itself. What are some of the initiatives we can take to conserve the oceans and work toward their long-term health? Well, 
look at what we're doing, what we put into the ocean, of what we're taking out of the sea, both in excess and both causing the destabilization of these natural systems that if you really pull back and think about it, this is our life support system. The ocean governs climate and weather, governs climate and weather, churns out most of the oxygen in the atmosphere, governs the chemistry of the planet. It's the great thermoregulator for the Earth. I gave a talk recently at the World Bank, and I chose as my opening image to make my points, an image that all of us have now taken for granted, owing to the, the observations of astronauts, that is Earth from space, the blue Earth. And I said, there it is, the World Bank. That's it. Those are the assets. That is the source of all that we hold near and dear, our economy, our health, our security, actually the substance of life itself. As to what we might be able to do about the situation, first, I think the greatest concern about climate change is that many people aren't taking it seriously, and many others aren't taking it seriously enough. To deal with a problem, you first have to recognize that you've got one. And generally speaking, people are not acting or reacting as if we've got a serious problem. Well, we do. Most worrisome, perhaps, is the accelerated warming trend caused by greenhouse gases. And you, Representative Markey, have articulated most of what I would have otherwise said and done it very well, putting on the balance sheet the issues that we now face including the acidification of the ocean and the warming, the, uh, the consequences of this warming trend with sea level rise. But what we, can we do about it as a nation? Well, one thing we can do is certainly to support policies to swiftly and sharply increase protection for natural systems on the land and in the sea. They are important for stabilizing the, the destructive trends that we are seeing. And of course, we should also stop, start at the source of those dis destructive trends and, and modify our behavior. Certainly, the upstream issues are important. Protecting forests benefits watersheds and rivers that inexorably flow into the sea. Healthier landscapes yield healthier seascapes. The United States can help by acknowledging the importance of methane in global warming and recognize the need to view climate change with an increased, enhanced sense of urgency. In a little submarine, I've been out off the coast of Mississippi, 100 miles, down 1,800 feet beneath the surface and seen methane bubbles burgling up, up out of the sea floor. And I've wondered what would happen with even a modest increase in temperature, which, which would enhance the release of methane, which would increase the rate of global warming with a great and classic feedback mechanism. Sadly, while the ocean provides the foundation for all of the planet systems that I've already articulated, driving climate and weather, and taking up and holding carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, shaping global chemistry, and providing home for most of life on Earth, the ocean nonetheless is being ignored by most of those who've been working on climate change issues, of all things. It's baffling to me that with all the attention being given to climate change, that you have to look pretty hard to find attention being given to what's happening to the ocean. And another good reason for having this hearing. One of the most important and positive things that this country can do to prepare for the consequences of climate change is to recognize the role of the ocean and take all possible measures to protect that vast but vulnerable system that governs the way the world works. The blue heart of the planet, the ocean, presently, is choked with plastic and other debris. Even more troubling is that other big problem with carbon dioxide, the acidification issue that you'll soon hear more about. Yet, there are many reasons for the United States to be optimistic, to consider the powerful influence that this country can have on the rest of the world by setting the right example. 
as well as providing help in blunting the sharp edge of climate change impact. Many people who do know what's going on feel helpless and therefore hopeless. There is time, but no time to waste. The next 10 years may be the most important in the next 10,000 years because of what we do or what we fail to do concerning climate change. It's never again, perhaps, we will have a chance. And those of you who represent this country have a unique opportunity to promote actions that will protect all that we hold near and dear. And that again, our wealth, our health, our security, and not only our lives, but all the lives to follow. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Earl, uh, so much for your testimony. Uh, our next uh, witness is uh, Dr. Jane um, Lubchenko, who is a professor at Oregon State University. She is also co-head of the Partnership for Interdisciplinary Studies of Coastal Oceans, a team of scientists that study the marine ecosystem along the West Coast. She served on the Pew Oceans Commission which made comprehensive U.S. ocean management recommendations in 2003. And she now works with the Joint Ocean Commission Initiative that seeks to uh, implement uh, those recommendations. Uh, for her work, Dr. Luchemko has received numerous awards, including eight honorary uh, degrees and a MacArthur Genius Fellowship. So we welcome you, Dr. Luchemko, whenever you are ready. Chairman Markey, ranking uh, minority member, Mr. Sensenbrenner, uh, members of the committee, it's a great pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, oceans have indeed been out of sight, out of mind, and it's nice to have an opportunity for them to be front and center. I hope this is just the beginning. My name is Jane Lubchenko. I'm Wayne and Gladys Valley Professor of Marine Biology at Oregon State University. And as you mentioned, I had the pleasure of serving on the Pew Oceans Commission and now on the Joint Ocean Commission Initiative. I'm here today as a marine scientist to describe some of the impacts of climate change on oceans and some of the implications that that has for us. Uh, I respectfully request that my PowerPoint images, which I will use, and a white paper on oceans and climate from the Joint Ocean Commission Initiative be entered into the record. Without objection, it will be included. Thank you very much. Um, I intend to uh, focus my remarks both on impacts and on implications today. Uh, and with respect to impacts, uh, I want to talk about two different categories of impacts. One are those that have been predicted and, in fact, are happening. Uh, that includes warmer oceans. Sea level temperatures are rising around the world in every single ocean basin. Sea level is rising. And as Dr. Kleypas will describe, oceans are becoming increasingly acidic, and that has huge consequences for much of life in oceans and in turn for us. I also wish, though, to focus on some surprises that are playing out that we suspect uh, are related to climate change. Uh, and they really underscore how little we really understand about how the oceans work and how they will change in future as these other predicted changes uh, come about. The, uh, there is no doubt that ocean temperatures are increasing and that sea level is becoming more acidic and ocean uh, levels are rising. It's worth noting that all of these are happening faster than originally predicted. Uh, warming and acidification are particularly serious threats to marine life and to the benefits provided by ocean ecosystems. Rising sea level is a very real problem for many people, in, especially in coastal communities, and for coastal habitats. But by and large, uh, on balance, the warming temperatures and increasing acidity are far greater threats for most of life in the oceans. Turning now to consideration of some of the surprises that we are seeing in oceans, I draw your attention to the western sides of most of the continents in the world uh, that are characterized by what are called coastal upwelling ecosystems. These ecosystems are particularly rich. They represent only 1% of the surface area of the oceans, but they have historically provided 20% of our global fisheries. Many of these systems are changing dramatically, and I'd like to describe some of the ways uh, that we are documenting. The systems 
uh, depend on winds that blow along the coast toward the equator. This in turn pushes surface waters away from the coast and brings up cold, nutrient-rich water, which is why these systems are so incredibly productive. Off the Pacific Northwest coasts, off Oregon and Washington, we have a seasonal upwelling that appears in the summertime. Uh, it's intermittent, so it's upwelling, alternating with downwelling. And our uh, rich systems uh, are legendary. What we are seeing is a very significant perturbation of this normal upwelling, uh, specifically the appearance of new dead zones. Now these are different from the dead zones that you have heard of in the Gulf of Mexico and elsewhere around the world that are driven by runoff of nutrients from the land. This is a different type of dead zone. It is caused by changes in the coastal winds and in ocean conditions, both of which we believe are likely related to climate change. We've seen a dead zone off the Pacific Northwest coast now six years in a row. Uh, 2006 was the longest lasting. It was four months long. It uh, occupied as much as two-thirds of the water column. This is a slice of the ocean uh, where you see in colors different amounts of dissolved oxygen. On the far right of the screen is uh, the land, and uh, the bottom shows uh, the coastal, the continental shelf getting deeper and deeper. Uh, and as much as two-thirds of the water column, the blues in here, are in fact uh, too low in oxygen for most marine life to persist, and so they suffocate. This image shows uh, where the dead zone is in blues and purples is the dead zone off the coast of Washington, Oregon in 2006. And you can see it's a very significant fraction of that shoreline. Um, our research teams have, in fact, been working hard to figure out what is happening and why. Uh, we've pieced together a story that suggests that changes in the coastal winds and uh, ocean conditions are the culprits here. There has not been a change in the runoff of land, so it's a different type of dead zone, but changes in ocean conditions and wind conditions are well described. We have images from remotely operated vehicles that have been driven along the seafloor showing uh, what the seafloor looked like in normal years, for example, in 2000, uh, and then uh, the devastation that has happened since then in 2002 and also 2006, the images that you see on the screen with just massive numbers of dead crabs, dead sea stars, dead urchins uh, on the ocean floor. I had a, vid a movie to show you, uh, but I'm not going to have time. I want to switch quickly to uh, the implications of this. Ocean ecosystems are already at serious risk. Many of the services that they provide to people are being threatened by overfishing, destructive fishing gear, a runoff of nutrients, chemical pollution, and coastal development. Um, the things that people want from oceans uh, are, in fact, at risk. And if society wishes to avoid the most serious consequences that climate change is already bringing and that will get worse, uh, we need to do a number of things. Reduce greenhouse gas emissions very significantly, first and foremost. Secondly, avoid mitigation, quote unquote, solutions that trigger serious unintended consequences. Third, as you mentioned, prepare to adapt to changes. But I believe we need to expand the way we think about adaptation. And it's not just adaptation of human systems, but in fact, we need to think about creating the conditions for nature to be able to adapt to the inevitable warmer waters and more acidic waters. If we have more funding for scientific research and monitoring, we can do a better job of helping to figure all of this out. And of course, educating citizens is incredibly important. Um, <coughs> strategies to minimize impacts of climate change uh, are both to reduce stresses that can be controlled and to protect as much biodiversity as possible. So in summary, Mr. Chairman, uh, oceans are in very serious trouble. Climate change will exacerbate them. We understand them relatively poorly. We need to reduce emissions. We need to make protecting ocean ecosystems one of the highest priorities, redefine adaptation to include creating the conditions for nature to adapt, increase funding, and educate citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you um, so much, Doctor. We very much appreciate your testimony. Um, uh, next, um, we are going to hear from Dr. Joan Claypass.
an ocean scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Uh, since joining uh, NCAR in 2002, uh, Dr. Uh, Claypass has become a leading voice on the impacts of climate change on the health of oceans and coral reefs. Um, her work has been featured in BBC News, Science Magazine, Science Daily, um, a real expert in the field. We welcome you, Doctor. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Chairman Markey, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, and members and staff of the Select Committee, thank you for holding this hearing on such an important and urgent issue. And I will reiter reiterate Dr. Earle's comment, we have a serious problem. I am a scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, and I have specialized on coral reefs for about 20 years. I thank you for this opportunity to discuss two serious consequences of climate change for coral reefs, ocean warming and ocean acidification. Oops. Since the 1950s, the tropical oceans have warmed on average by more than a half degree Fahrenheit. And this warming has caused a phenomenon called coral bleaching. Bleaching happens when a coral expels a colorful algae that lives within its tissue and provides that coral with mo most of its energy. Bleaching is often fatal. Coral bleaching has already destroyed about 10 percent of reefs worldwide and has weakened many more. The projections of bleaching patterns indicate that if ocean warming continues along its current path, we will lose this ecosystem. We hope that corals can adapt to the warming, but there is really uh, very little evidence that they can do so. The other problem I want to raise is something known as the other carbon dioxide problem. This is ocean acidification. The concept of ocean acidification can be explained with a, a bottle of carbonated water. So that water was carbonated simply by adding CO2 or carbon dioxide to it. And carbonated water is more acidic than just regular tap water, and anybody can test this with uh, litmus or pH paper. The oceans have already uh, absorbed about a third of the carbon dioxide re released into the atmosphere by man's activities. And this is, really is a natural gift because it lessens the impact of climate change. But it is changing ocean chemistry. Although we can't feel the change, we can measure it, and measurements are confirming that ocean acidification is indeed happening. So there are two main ways that ocean acidification affect marine organisms. First, it can stress the organisms physiologically, such as um, increasing its respiration rate, lower reproduction and lower survival. And second, what we know the most about, too, is that acidification impacts the ability of marine organisms to secrete their skeletons or their shells. This includes many important groups of marine organisms, from microscopic algae at the base of the food chain to familiar organisms like clams, starfish, and corals. Corals are the best studied of these, and there is uh, strong evidence that their calcification rates will decline by 10 to 50 percent within the next 40 to 50 years. They simply won't grow as fast, or they will grow more uh, fragilely. And it's, you can think of it as osteoporosis. This slide shows a dramatic example of a coral cultured in normal versus acidified seawater. Ocean acidification not only slows skeletal formation, but at some point it actually dissolves it. So what, what does this mean for the coral? Well, organisms that produce shells do so for a reason, for protection, for example. Uh, even if this naked coral in this slide could somehow survive in the real world, it would be living as an anemone, not as a coral, and it wouldn't be producing coral reefs. In fact, reefs themselves exist because corals and other organisms build the reef faster than it is eroded. Ocean acidification attacks the reef structure itself by increasing the rate at which it dissolves. And if reefs erode away, we will lose many of the valuable services that they provide, and that includes high biodiversity, fisheries, and shoreline protection. So what can we do be done about ocean acidification and warming? Obviously, reducing greenhouse gas emissions tackles the root cause of both, and we need to reduce those emissions aggressively. Given that coral bleaching is already so widespread, we may already be above the threshold for that ecosystem. For acidification, certainly we need to find a way to keep carbon dioxide levels below 500 parts per million, because above that level, some reefs will start to erode away. 
It's worth noting here that geoengineering solutions to reduce warming, such as putting dust into the atmosphere or sunshades in space, do not solve the problem of, of ocean acidification because those solutions don't reduce carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. I want to uh, also stress that ocean acidification affects not just coral reefs, but it affects all marine ecosystems. And I, I really feel that this may be the greatest environmental threat that we face this century. It's a new issue, and we have our hands full just trying to understand the scope of the problem. Um, we need to know how much carbon dioxide is too much carbon dioxide, but we also need to know what we can do to help marine ecosystems make it through this difficult time. So I urge you first to take on the task of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and second to pass the 4M Act, to, which is an act to increase research on ocean acidification. And, and I just want to sign off with a comment that uh, 25 years ago we thought that global warming was going to be good for reefs because they like warm water. They would expand. Well, now we, you know, now we know about coral bleaching. We know about ocean acidification. Climate change is not good for coral reefs. And what's at stake if we lose them is the most biodiverse ecosystem of the ocean. It's one that supports major fisheries and economies of the U.S. states and territories. It protects many shorelines. And of course, this is a masterpiece among God's creations. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Doctor, very much. And our final witness is uh, Ms. Uh, Vicki Spruill, who is the President and CEO of the Ocean Conservancy, where she leads the organization's efforts to promote healthy and diverse ocean uh, ecosystems. Uh, she was also recently appointed to the Pew Fellows Advisory Committee. Uh, we welcome you. Uh, whenever you feel ready, please begin. Thank you, Chairman Markey, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, and the committee for your leadership in having this hearing. The committee has already done such a service to the country by moving us forward on the urgent issues of energy independence and climate change. Your effort today to focus on the ocean, the place where it all starts and yet is often overlooked, is of enormous importance. It's a real honor to be on such a distinguished panel of women. <laughs> Had to say it. The ocean is essential to the health of everything on the planet, including our own. It covers over two-thirds of the Earth, it drives our climate, it provides much of the food we eat, and the oxygen that's essential for our very survival. It's a source of renewal for the human spirit. Fundamentally, as Sylvia says, the ocean is the life support system for our planet. Seafood is a major staple, in some cases the staple, in this country and elsewhere. In the US, the contribution of the seafood industry exceeds $50 billion per year. A healthy ocean contributes to a healthy economy. The President's Commission on Ocean Policy reported that coastal communities generated over 10% of GDP. Three quarters of those associated jobs are in ocean tourism and the recreation sectors alone. The ocean, of course, also moderates our climate, absorbing over a third of the greenhouse gases we produce. The dynamics of the ocean and the atmosphere are so tightly linked and so easily overlooked that we ignore the, the ocean's role in climate at our own peril. In 2005, millions in the U.S. and in the Caribbean experienced firsthand, and quite tragically, how the ocean's heat engine can drive violent storms, most dramatically, of course, Hurricane Katrina. Over 2,000 lives were lost and over $100 billion in damage occurred during that devastating season. Fundamentally, the ocean is the basis of our ecosystem with an incredibly diverse web of life that supports the planet. Of course, we're most familiar with the grand diversity of life at the margins, on coral reefs and in tide pools where many of us saw our first mussels and sea stars and maybe even a hermit crab looking back at us. The truth is that our essential and diverse ocean ecosystems cannot protect us unless they are healthy and resilient. Harmful impacts are exacting a toll on this web of life that, frankly, we can no longer afford to pay. Ocean Conservancy is working to make the ocean healthy by fostering sustainable fisheries, by protecting marine wildlife, and putting in place management plans for state and federal waters, and preserving magnificent ocean places that we like to call Yosemite's undersea. All of this work is vitally important, but the most sweeping and devastating threat to the ocean is global climate change. The planet has warmed in the last 100 years by nearly a degree, and over 80% of the excess heat produced by the greenhouse effect has already been absorbed 
by the ocean. Even if carbon emissions are substantially reduced, ocean warming will continue to increase for decades. Two or more degrees of warming, which is quite possible, will devastate many coastal communities, kill the world's coral reefs, and result in mass extinctions of marine life. Think about it. When our own temperatures rise two degrees, we have a fever. So our ocean is sick. And if you're an Alaskan native whose people have lived in harmony with the Arctic, for, uh, Arctic Ocean for over 10,000 years, and your village is falling into the sea, you know that climate change is happening and that our ocean is sick. If you're a fisherman in the Caribbean, where up to 90% of corals bleached and died in 2005, then you don't doubt that climate change is actually happening now. The ocean is really where the rubber meets the road with climate change. It isn't decades of projections we're dealing with or ominous warnings about the future of the ocean. It is now. This is happening now. And if you detect a sense of urgency in my voice, it's because I believe that protecting our ocean from the onslaught of climate change is one of the greatest challenges of our lifetimes. 2008 is the year of the reef, and I commend the committee for drawing attention to this fragile yet critical ecosystem. Coral reefs have long been threatened by overexploitation and pollution, and now climate change adds another one-two punch, maybe the knockout punch, for an already damaged system. Ocean warming has already increased coral bleaching and is a major threat to reefs worldwide. Let me put it this way. In 1998, we lost 16 percent of the world's coral reefs in a single year. If we lost 16 percent of the forests in the world, that would be the equivalent to losing all of the forests in North America in a single year. Unless we change course, coral reefs, the entire ocean, and all of mankind are at the mercy of climate change. There are two essential ways we must address climate change. First, of course, is mitigation. We must substantially reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and we must do that now. And the second is adaptation, simply meaning we have to strengthen the health and resiliency of our ocean ecosystems so they can better anticipate and adapt to the increased stresses of climate change while we work to reduce emissions. It's as if we have a patient who's already been suffering from the flu and high blood pressure and now has been given a diagnosis of serious but treatable cancer. The plan for recovery involves curing the patient of the flu and then taking some medication and adapting your lifestyle to lower the blood pressure. But of course, fighting the cancer, in our case, global climate change, is the goal. But the way to do that is to first make the patient healthy and strong, to take on the much bigger challenges ahead. To save our coral reefs, we must adopt adaptation strategies that build resilience and restore ecosystem function. We need to be protecting reefs from unsustainable fishing practices. We need to be reducing the inputs of pollution, such as fertilizers and sewage and sediments. And we need to be implementing a more comprehensive and stronger system of coral reef protected areas. I know this committee and that this Congress is working hard on mitigation solutions, trying to cure the disease. I would respectfully urge you to follow your principles that you set forth last week on Earth Day and put as much effort into adaptation strategies to lessen the damage and pain as we seek to cure the patient. We simply have to do a better job of sustaining the life support system that sustains us. Our oceans are in trouble, and that means so are we. That's the sea change we're starting at Ocean Conservancy, and thank you for propelling that change forward with your leadership. Thank you, Ms. Spruill, very much. And we thank uh, all of our witnesses. And uh, Ms. Spruill raises a very good point that we have four brilliant women who are testifying <laughs> here today simultaneously. And that's what happens when you have two women PhDs in science, Dr. Anna Unruh Cohen and uh, Dr. Stephanie Herring. Um, uh, plan the meeting. Somehow or other, they find four more brilliant women uh, <laughs> to all give the testimony. So uh, <clears throat> that's the uh, you know that that's the kind of the the, the theme for today's uh, hearing, appropriately so. So let me begin with uh, you, Dr. Earl. Um, just give us your summary of how your views have changed, how the world's views have changed, of the science of the seas over the last 30 or 40 years. Where were we then? And where are we today in terms of the, 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 uh, the way in which we should view the seas, their health, and the danger uh, to the planet? There was a widespread view that many still hold that the ocean is infinite in its capacity to rebound no matter what we take out 
or whatever we put in. The best way to get rid of something was to deep six it, <laughs> throw it into the sea. We thought that our job was to find new and better ways to extract wildlife out of the ocean, going back to the 1960s and 70s, and some still hold to that view. The importance of wildlife in the ocean was primarily viewed as a commodity, a protein from the sea. I think we've learned a great deal. Well, actually, we've learned more in the last half century than during all preceding human history about the ocean, about a lot of things, but certainly about the ocean. We didn't even know, and Rachel Carson was not even aware of the mountain ranges that run like giant backbones down the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans when she wrote The Sea Around Us in the early 1950s. We did not know at that time that there was life from the surface of the ocean to the greatest depth. We certainly didn't appreciate the profound impact that the living systems, particularly the microbes, have on all of us, on the nature of the ocean, the little guys that do the heavy lifting with respect to to churning out oxygen and, and taking on carbon dioxide. We now know much that should alert us to the importance of taking care of the ocean that takes care of us. We certainly would not like to see the demise of rainforests. We would feel the, the loss if something devastated them even more than they have been devastated. But in fact, if they did go, if we still had a healthy ocean, life would probably continue. But if we did away with the ocean or seriously impacted the health of the ocean, everything, everything would be impacted. The ocean really rules the world. And one of the baffling things that, that strikes me today is that although that knowledge has been around for a while, it's been growing over the last half century, but we still don't take the ocean seriously enough. And it's no more apparent than in the climate change issues where great attention, at least up to the present time, has been focused on the atmosphere. But as all of us have pointed out, there are, there are links, that, inextricable links to the sea. In fact, the, the, the ocean really is the, the, the governor of climate and climate change. Thank you. Um, Dr. Lubchenco and Dr. Claypass, what has your uh, research shown about the pace of climate change when you kind of compare it with geologic uh, history? What, what's happening now as you look back over the whole history of the planet? Mr. Chairman, the history of Earth is a very dynamic history. Uh, we have seen many, many changes over uh, millennia. And what is striking about the changes that have been happening uh, with respect to climate change over the last century is the rate of change. The changes are so much faster than the background levels. In many cases, uh, the levels of some greenhouse gases exceed historic or previous levels, uh, but it's the rate of change that is really um, particularly striking. Even knowing that, many of the models, the early climate change models that were created, have predicted rates of change that um, reflect our current measurements, and even those predictions have been too low. We are seeing much faster changes than even our best models have predicted. One of the best examples of that is the melting of ice in the Arctic. The floating sea ice uh, that has always created a very dynamic, rich habitat and upon which the peoples of the Arctic have depended, as well as all the rich marine life there. And that, that area is warming so much faster than was originally predicted. The models are just continually revised and revised. The same is true of ocean acidification. It's happening faster than we had initially thought that it would. Uh, and I believe that this theme is one that we haven't yet sufficiently paid attention to. In light of this knowledge, we need to be even more conservative 
in our use of natural resources and even more aggressive in our attempts to slow down the rate of climate change. Uh, Dr. Claypass. Um, I'd like to uh, key in on a couple of things, the rates of change and adaptation. So we often use the term adaptation a lot, particularly in terms of human adaptation. And we're an extremely adaptable species. But most of these organisms that are in the ocean have not seen these kind of changes, either the magnitude or the speed at which they're changing for millions of years. I think the last time we've seen an ocean acidification event was about 55 million years ago. That was only 10 years after the dinosaurs were wiped out. And we, even then, that rate of change was probably not as fast as what we're seeing today. And during that time period, there were a lot of big changes that happened in the ocean that can be attributed to ocean acidification. So adaptation, we can, we can count on that for a lot of humans, but I don't think we can expect these ecosystems to adapt alongside us, not unless we do a lot of things to help them. So uh, you've heard these concerns. What what should, how can we explain this to the public? What, what is your recommendation in, in terms of having the fire alarm sound so that uh, we ensure that uh, this does not result in catastrophic consequences? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm not a researcher. I consider myself a, you know, a translator and a communicator. And I represent a constituency of people across the country who are very much hungry for change. And I think today the good news is we've got a combination of increased awareness and this growing sense of urgency and momentum. We really have a golden opportunity to act. Um, I would, there are actually three things um, that I think we would want to encourage Congress to do. First, of course, uh, is to make that link between climate change and oceans. That process has already begun today. And that means making adaptation strategies part of every climate change bill passed by Congress. The second thing is there are a number of good bills already in the pipeline. Um, Oceans 21, which passed subcommittee just last week, the Coral Reef Protection Act, the Marine Sanctuaries Act, all of these bills, if passed, help to provide these adaptation strategies that you've heard about today. And then third, I would say, uh, to continue with my medical uh, analogy, first, we need to be doing no harm. Uh, we need to be looking at some of these technological solutions. They obviously have a place, but we need to be moving carefully towards any proposals and uh, make sure that the, the cure isn't actually worse than the disease. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Earl, why why don't people understand the relationship between the ocean and the planet? What, what do you attribute that huge gap to? How can such a huge percentage of the Earth's surface be something that just is not part of public consciousness? It's the great mystery of the sea. <laughs> uh, I had occasion to ask that very question to Claire Booth Luce once, and she looked skyward and she said, well, looking at the big puffy clouds, heaven is there and you know what's in the other direction. <laughs> Whatever the reason, uh, because perhaps we are terrestrial by nature and only in fairly recent times have human beings acquired access to the sea, effective access to the sea, but we're still beginning. Scuba divers go down maybe 100 feet, 150 feet perhaps, if they push the edge a bit. But we're still exploring the ocean. Less than 5% of the sea has been seen at all, let alone explored. And because of our attitude that the ocean is a place to throw things away, or it's a place just to, well, if you think of fish, fish are to eat, right? Without thinking that fish are to the sea as birds are to the land. There are components of our life support system. They are, as, as uh, has been said about components of the land, the nuts, the bolts, the cogs, the wheels that, that make the ocean work. And it's not just the fish, it's all of the diversity of life in the sea. We need to respect fish alive, not just fish dead. And coral reefs alive, not just ornaments for your shelf. We need to think about the ocean with a new attitude. And it is happening, but it needs to happen faster than it presently is. So, um which organisms, uh, which ecosystems are most vulnerable right now to this acceleration of climate change? I can answer a bit, but we all can weigh in. 
uh, the acidification is, is comprehensive in its impact. We can look at coral reefs because we're familiar with them. We don't see the tiny creatures, the coccolithophorids, the foraminifera, the little calcareous shelled creatures that make up much of the life in the sea and that drive much of the ocean chemistry. But we better pay attention, and it is important. <laughs> with every breath we take, it's important to understand this. And it's not rocket science, as they say. This is, <laughs> this is ocean science, which is really a lot of fun, as well as really important. Dr. Lubchenko. Mr. Chairman, I believe that Sylvia has given an answer that I would agree with. Um, relative to warming, certainly uh, those communities, those ecosystems that are in the tropics and those at the poles uh, are, appear to be most vulnerable, uh, but every community is vulnerable to the increased acidity of oceans. And that is going to be um, one of the biggest challenges facing all of us because uh, of, of its consequences at all different levels from the microscopic plants, uh, through the filter feeders, to the herbivores, predators, on up the food web, uh, anything with a shell or a skeleton. And so crabs, lobsters, sea stars, urchins, uh, microscopic plants, mussels, oysters, snails, all of those are going to be affected by this acidification. And those critters are everywhere. Dr. Kleipas, are there, are there particular areas of the ocean that we should uh, prioritize for protection? Thank you, Dr. Uh, Chairman Markey. I, I would say that um, the shallow oceans are where most of the life is. That's where the primary product production occurs, where they use sunlight to create the bulk that feeds the rest of the ocean. Uh, so the shallow oceans, I would say, are, are the, the place of urgency right now. And it, it does extend from the tropics to the poles. So that would be my answer. Um, uh, Ms. Spruill, uh, as Congress considers legislation to reduce our global warming pollution, what other policies, in your opinion, are necessary uh, to help protect the oceans from climate change? Well, I think I, I, I named three that are that are actually already in the pipeline, and um, a little push from this committee would would uh, go a very long way. Oceans 21. I Oceans think. 21. Why don't you just outline a little bit of what each yeah. one of these uh, bills yeah. does and why yeah. it, it, they're important to pass? Uh, so Oceans 21 really creates a, a national ocean policy, and and then a mechanism for implementing that policy across. Uh, a variety of, of federal agencies. It's really the the coordinating function that we need uh, across so many federal agencies. This grew out of uh, both presidential commissions, and as you mentioned, Dr. Lubchenko was on the Pew Commission. She can maybe talk a little bit more about the genesis of, of that legislation. Then there's the Coral Reef uh, Conservation Act, which uh, has actually passed the House and, and awaits Senate floor action. So these are, these are uh, bills that are quite far along in the pipeline. That promotes community-based conservation and provides tools at the local level, a number of these adaptation strategies that we've discussed. And it empowers NOAA to uh, respond to damaged reefs. Again, an, another adaptation strategy, if you will. And then there's the National Marine Sanctuaries Act, which certainly has the promise, at least, of protecting more of our ocean and, and making it more resilient, uh, as we've already discussed, in the, in the face of unforeseen climate change. Thank you. Um, Dr. Lubchenko, uh, Ms. Pruel referred to it. What, how successful has the federal government been in implementing the recommendations from the Commission? Uh, we had hoped to have seen much more progress by now. Uh, I think hope still remains that Congress... What's the, what's the obstacle, in your opinion? Um, I believe that it's part of what we've been talking about at these hearings, that oceans are not on a lot of people's radar screens. Uh, and in the press of so many other important issues, uh, it's sometimes hard to break through. Uh, and so the reality that oceans are in trouble uh, and that there is real urgency has not penetrated uh, as far as it needs to go. Um, it's also the case that I think there are uh, vested interests in sort of current arrangements. Uh, many of the recommendations call for much more comprehensive ways of having different agencies, different departments be able to work together uh, collaboratively 
uh, and to work toward much more comprehensive uh, integration of ocean decisions. Um, that's always a, a, a tough sell. Uh, I believe that uh, we are making uh, some good, significant progress, but there's just a lot more to be done. Can, can we um, just go down and explain each one, of, each one of you, give us one example, in your opinion, of how what happens to the ocean then affects those of us who are living on land. Hmm. And I think that kind of will help to dramatize uh, what the what the uh, what the storyline is for us if we continue to ignore the oceans as a part of this story. So begin with you, Ms. Rule. Do you have one good example that you'd like to use? I have a list of examples, Chairman Markey. Uh, and I'm going to, to uh, include them in the context of, of climate change, um, because I think you know, that's where we're going to feel the impacts first. And obviously, coastal communities um, will, will be influenced. We're going to see change in, changes in fisheries. There's no doubt about that. It's going, uh, climate change is going to disrupt availability. It's going to raise seafood prices. Um, there are human health considerations. Um, human health is predicted to decline um, uh, due to climate change related causes. Food and water shortages, we've already seen some of this brought about um, because of areas affected by drought. Insurance rates, we're already seeing uh, rates affected because of extreme weather events such as hurricanes. Our infrastructure needs. Uh, are only going to increase as sea levels rise. New reports have been released that show that you know states are going to need to be spending more money on roads and on homes and on airports. Uh, and of course, these coastal communities are, are going to feel these losses most in the coming decades. Uh, Dr. Earl, do you have a vivid example of how we are affected? I think it's important. It's important to first understand the basic process and then see how the changes are influencing those processes. So think about every breath you take. Where does, where does the oxygen come from? 20% of the atmosphere is oxygen, 80% or so is nitrogen, just enough carbon dioxide to make the green plants do their thing to produce more oxygen through photosynthesis and thus drive the great food chains. That's the way it's been now for many millions of years. It wasn't always that way. Earth wasn't always hospitable for the likes of us. And I think that's something many people need to, to uh, put on the balance sheet, that what we have today represents the distillation of all preceding history. Literally hundreds of millions of years have led us to a planet that works in our favor. There was a time going way back before dinosaurs when there wasn't 20% oxygen in the atmosphere. But today there is. We have the power, the capacity to change that through what we're doing to the engine, the green engine that, that in the ocean as well as on the land that produces that oxygen. So first understand how the system works and then realize we are really messing that system up. And it's also true with the, with the water you drink. People think it comes out of the spigot, water does, or you get it in little bottles when you go to the store. No, most of Earth's water, 97%, is in the ocean. How does it get into the bottles, into your sink, whatever? It goes up into the atmosphere in, as clouds, mostly from the ocean. Take away the ocean, you just eliminate the water system. Of the, yeah, so it's, it's first understand that and then realize what we are doing that is disrupting that system. Come back to you, Dr. Claypass. Do you have an example? I think um, to play on what Sylvia said, you know, when you have these ecosystems are not separate. You don't just lose one ecosystem. You're going to have a cascading effect. And, and the example I had for coral reefs is that they provide the environment where we can have mangroves and seagrass beds. Those are very good fishing areas. So if we lose coral reefs, we lose a lot of other ecosystems that are intertwined with that ecosystem. But I agree with you, it's hard to explain to someone that has lived in Kansas their entire life and maybe has never seen the ocean to really make those links. And that's where we, we fail in the education. It, if we lose um, our economies and our coastal regions, which really depend on the, the oceans, we're going to affect 
all of the cities in the U.S. and elsewhere. It's it's hard to imagine that economic impacts on the coast are not going to to permeate the rest of the economy. Dr. Lutenko, do you have an example? When I was on the Pew Oceans Commission, Mr. Chairman, uh, <clears throat> we uh, were told something that I actually hadn't thought about, and that was that half of America lives on the coasts, the other half goes there to play. And I think that that's a, a nice uh, touchstone. As the Pew Ocean Commission moved around from one city to another to another, all along the coastal margins and also in the heartland, I asked Americans exactly the question that you posed to us. What do you want from oceans? What do you care about oceans? Why should we be thinking about uh, changing anything? And what I heard from them were five things, boiled down to five things. Americans told us they wanted safe seafood, healthy seafood, number one. Number two, clean beaches. Number three, abundant wildlife. Number four, stable fisheries. No more of this boom and bust and closures. And fifth, vibrant coastal communities. Now, I think that's a really nice summary and synthesis of the way Americans think about oceans. And I think that they truly understand that they appreciate them, they want these things. What they don't understand is that all of those things depend on healthy, productive, and resilient ecosystems. And that's not what we're seeing now. We're seeing serious degradation and disruption and depletion and climate change is going to exacerbate that very, very seriously. Well, let me, let me ask you this then. Uh, now you've outlined the problem, each one of you. Now let's talk about solutions. Uh, do any of you have an example that you'd like to give us of, of something that's happening that's very positive uh, that you can point to that wouldn't have been happening 10 years ago? Uh, and, um, and in giving that answer, are you optimistic? that we can build on your example uh, to find a comprehensive solution to uh, the problem. Uh, let me go back through you again, Dr. Earl. I think one of the greatest causes for hope is our expanding level of communication, that any little kid can look at the world with it, through the eyes of an astronaut now. Hold the world in your hands when you pull up Google Earth, for heaven's sakes. There it is. The whole world. You can spin it around. You can look at your backyard. You can see your neighbor's backyard. Be careful. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe someday, before long, you'll be able to take dives in the ocean and be able to see what is going on in the ocean. Not only to look at the blue blob that is now the surface, but to be able to actually see what's going on below, the good news and the bad news. And I think that's not only good for kids, I think that's good for all of us, to be able to have new ways to see how we are connected to the rest. I, I'm optimistic in part because there is a growing concern that people, kids, are, and all of us, increasingly are detached from nature. And there is some effort to do something about that. The last child in the woods, no child left inside these <laughs> initiatives. Beautiful. To, while you learn your ABCs and your one, two, threes, learn that you're connected to nature and that the ocean dominates nature. Those things are beginning to happen. We need to do much more to accelerate those things. Dr. Lubchenko. Mr. Chairman, I had the pleasure of serving on uh, the Oregon Governor's Advisory Group, Citizens Advisory Group on Global Warming, uh, which began as a group of citizens that didn't know a lot about the problem. And in the process of our deliberations, uh, they learned about them and came to make some very strong, unanimous recommendations to the governor that have now, uh, many of which have been adopted, others are currently uh, being developed. Uh, and those essentially will put Oregon on a path to very significantly reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, to slow the rate of growth, to cap that, and then finally to um, return to 1990 levels. Um, that um, action of one state has been mirrored by many other states, including yours. 
Uh, and states working together along the West Coast and in New England have been making very significant uh, progress in drawing attention to the problem and in uh, beginning to address it in very serious ways. I get hope from that, and I believe that now it's Congress's turn to act in kind and to listen to what the states have been saying and to do uh, for the rest of the country what these states have begun to do and to take it even further. The reason that I draw hope from all of these issues uh, is partly the knowledge that social systems can often change very, very rapidly. We've seen that in attitudes toward drunk driving, towards smoking, uh, towards women's suffrage, towards civil rights issues. And so we know that it is possible to have very, very rapid change. It's my hope that we are getting closer and closer and that Congress will show very real leadership in bringing us to the tipping point and having some very meaningful actions to put us on the right path. Uh, Dr. Claypass. Uh, I may have it when I'm traveling on planes and putting all that extra CO2 in the atmosphere to, to interview the people next to me about what they know about climate change and including ocean, ocean acidification. And I've been astounded in the last year, I'd say the last year, maybe two, at how much people know. Now, this is somewhat elite group. These are people that fly planes. But the what I have noticed is so many people are becoming more aware, and they're no longer arguing with me that, is this really happening? For a long time, I got the question, is this really happening? Now I'm hearing the question, what can we do? So people are hungry for solutions. They're hungry for choices. They're willing to sacrifice. I'm just seeing this momentum. And it is time to sort of seize that and, and do what Jane was saying. You know, the states have become leaders in this issue. If the US becomes a leader in this issue and finds real solutions, either technologically or through uh, invoking social change, uh, then the rest of the world will follow. We've been a leader for so long. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Ms. Pruel. Well, at the risk of stating the obvious, uh, Mr. Chairman, I actually think this hearing is a bright spot, uh, that the dots are being connected like this between ocean and climate change would not have happened even five years ago. And I would agree with the, my panelists that this level of awareness brought about by the urgency of climate change is creating a formula that we have not had before and we need to seize on that opportunity. I'm actually hopeful about coral reefs and I, I want to bring it to that, back to that in this year of the reef. Um, I think there is some hope even in the face of this dire news we've heard today. If we act decisively now, we can save some of those reefs that still remain. And I think uh, certainly emerging science is showing us that if we can protect the integrity and the resilience of these systems, they should be able to withstand uh, some of these climate change stresses that we can't yet anticipate. So, but, but we have to act now. So let, let's, um, let's get here at the end of the hearing. One minute summation from each of you, what you want us to remember about the ocean, about ocean policy, about the responsibility of the United States government to be the leader in the world, to protect it and to have a leadership role that commands the respect of the rest of the world when we ask them to, uh, to work with us on these issues. And let's go in the opposite order of the uh, opening statements. So we'll start uh, with you, Ms. Spruill, if we may, uh, in giving us your concluding uh, Thank you, Chairman Markey. I, I think uh, as the policy organization represented at the table, I'm going to probably summarize with uh, some brass tacks and, and restate those. There's a lot that we can that we can already do that's that's already in the pipeline to move forward on some of these uh, problems we've talked about today. First, every climate change bill should support adaptation strategies. Mitigation alone is not going to solve this problem. And we need to take on both the cure and the recovery simultaneously. And you know, these adaptation strategies could be and actually should be paid for by funding from the auction of carbon allowances. So uh, there's, a, there's a mechanism there. Second, 
This Congress should pass the three bills that I outlined previously, Oceans 21, the Coral Reef Conservation Act, and the National Marine Sanctuaries Act. Um, Oceans 21 is successfully out of subcommittee, and it would be a major step forward in providing this comprehensive ocean management scheme that we've talked about. And then lastly, do no harm. Um, I think that uh, we need to be researching some of these technological solutions. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Claypass. Well, I think, first of all, I, I think you guys have gotten the point that the oceans are in trouble, that we, we really need to act rapidly. Um, we can't afford a doubling of CO2 from pre-industrial levels in the atmosphere. I, I really stress that we try to keep it below that. The hopeful note is that we know that warming has some momentum and that even if we cap carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we still ha will have a increased warming. With ocean acidification, if we can stop ocean atmospheric CO2 concentrations, that will stop ocean acidification process. If we can remove CO2 from the atmosphere, it reverses the situation. So it's a fixable, it's a fixable problem. Uh, we also talk a lot about the importance of ocean ecosystems to our economies. You know, we're always asked to put a dollar value on all of the things that the oceans offer to us. But I, I, there's something we're missing here, and that's, that's this aesthetic quality of the oceans. We've, we talk about so many of these ecosystems being rainforests of the sea and so forth. Uh, I think we can't forget that. That's something we have to leave for future generations. And I, I, if anything sticks in your mind, with, is it, one of my favorite quotes, and it's from Jacques Cousteau, and it is, people protect what they love. All of you who love the sea, please help us protect her. So I'd ask you to help us protect that ocean. Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Lubchenko. I guess I would uh, highlight four quick things. I truly believe we are at a crossroads right now. And the choice that we have to make is between the path that we're on, which has been called by one scientist, Jeremy Jackson, the slippery slope to slime, which is the direction that oceans are headed in now due to all of the threats, including climate change. The other path is what I like to think of as the mutiny for the bounty. And I think that we really are at a crossroads. And we need to understand that and have the courage to choose the right thing because it's in our interest to do so. The second thing I would highlight is that we need to think about adaptation differently. It's not just adaptation of human systems, but we need to cr understand how to create the conditions for wildlife to adapt to the changes that are inevitable. And that means reducing other stresses, uh, managing fisheries very conservatively, uh, eliminating destructive fishing gear, reducing flow of nutrients and chemical pollutants to the coasts, uh, protecting habitats as much as possible, and it means creating networks of no-take marine reserves and protected areas so that the raw material, uh, as, as, many, as much genetic diversity and as many species as possible, have the best chance to adapt to changes that are inevitable. So expanding the way we think about adaptation. Thirdly, I would uh, emphasize the importance of significantly increasing the funding for scientific monitoring and research. It's woefully inadequate for us to understand and to better advise how to do this adaptation, how to do uh, many of the things that lie ahead. Uh, and fourthly, uh, I would suggest much more comprehensive understanding of oceans, uh, management of oceans through mechanisms such as those in the Oceans 21 bill, but also educating citizens are vitally important. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Dr. Earl. Well, first I want to wholeheartedly endorse all of the above. <laughs> well said. I will add only a few little additional comments that we have a chance to protect what remains of all preceding history that still exists in the wild places on the planet. The United States took the lead going back to the early part of the 20th century. Some say the best idea America ever had, which was the national park system, an idea that is now being 
adopted in some measure in the sea, although they're more, um, there's more of an attitude of management, managing instead of protecting uh, areas in the sea. There's some 4,000 worldwide of, of places that are known as marine protected areas. But there isn't full protection for the wildlife that's there. We, we can do a much better job of taking care of our own exclusive economic zone, an area that exceeds the side, size of the rest of the United States put together. We have a chance to do something really bold in our own waters. And another thing to do is to take a leadership role. Others followed the example back in the early part of the 20th century. Here we are at the early part of the 21st. What we could do to take a role through encouraging actions on the part of other nations to look at the high seas, the 64% of the ocean that is beyond national jurisdictions, and to encourage through treaties, through partnerships, through our own example, to look at the Arctic and to the Antarctic, where Antarctic 50 years ago, a treaty was put into place. And we, are, we were among the primary instigators of that treaty to protect, forestall the development, the destruction in many ways of that distillation of all preceding history. There's a chance right now to do something like that for the Arctic before it gets, before the, the frozen goose is cooked, if you will. We have a chance to do something in the Arctic now, but if we wait much longer in terms of asserting ourselves as leaders and working with others to show that the advantage of protection exceeds by far the advantage of short-term exploitation, this is the moment, and I think you've heard it repeatedly from all of us, this is a moment in time when, as never before, we recognize we've got a problem, and maybe as never again, we can do something about it. Beautiful. Thank you, Dr. Earle. Now, while you are each giving your concluding statements to the committee, uh, fortunately, uh, Congressman uh, Emanuel Cleaver from the state of Missouri has arrived, and I will now recognize him for a uh, statement or a round of questions, whatever is his choosing. Well, I, I apologize uh, for, uh, for being late. Uh, this is certainly a panel that I I wanted to hear, and your written comments uh, are along the lines of what I think is needed for our, our country. I, um, I was thrown into some panic over the weekend when I uh, read about the shark attack uh, in uh, San Diego. Um, being from Kansas City, Missouri, and I'm a, I'm a United Methodist pastor, Satchel Page's family uh, were members of our, our church, and, and in fact, I, I eulogized uh, uh, the great Satchel Page. And Satchel once told me that uh, he and uh, one of the, his teammates were out fishing, and as they're sitting there on the bank fishing, uh, that uh, a water moccasin came out of the, the water and his teammate uh, grabbed a huge brick to kill it and Satchel said to him, uh, no, uh, we're not going to kill him because we came into his house. Uh, and if he comes into our house, uh, that's a different story, but when we're at his house, we don't kill him. And, and so my, my fear every time I hear about a shark bite is that it feeds, pardon the pun, the, the uh, men and, and women who would suggest that you know the best white shark is a dead white shark, and so um, and and so we, they they can do this aimless killing of of these uh, uh, fantastic animals, uh, and and without regard to the fact that the shark would would never go into 7-Eleven uh, to to kill anyone, I mean, that you know you'd have to come. <laughs> into his house. Uh, and so I, I, am, I am very concerned about that. And, I, and as I'm reading that, I'm driving by um, last, last evening uh, here in Washington, uh, seafood restaurant after seafood restaurant after seafood restaurant, restaurant and I'm, I'm deeply concerned about uh, the overfishing uh, 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 in our oceans. And I, uh, and I, 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 I think we ought to try to do more than, than just condemn it, uh, that, that at some point 
uh, we need to, to move legislatively, um, and in some instances, maybe even militarily, uh, to prevent overfishing. Uh, I don't want to delay you. Uh, you know, you came here uh, t today and, and provided fantastic uh, uh, testimony. And I hope that in the days, months, and years to come that you will continue to be resources uh, for those of us who uh, believe that uh, the ocean is the key to our survival on this little ball that uh, encircles the, the, the sun. And um, I'm not at all sure that the ocean receives the respect uh, that, that it should from those of us who depend on it, even those who depend on it and don't know it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman from Missouri. He reminds us again of what a powerful combination a minister can be when talking about moral issues that actually come into the political realm, which is this responsibility that we have uh, to protect the planet. Um, and, uh, and we thank each of you um, uh, for testifying here today. Um, the planet is running a fever. There are no hospitals for sick planets. Uh, we have to engage in preventative care in order to avoid catastrophic uh, consequences. That is our opportunity, our responsibility. Uh, the most important Supreme Court decision regarding the environment in history in Massachusetts versus EPA uh, just one year ago, April of 2007, uh, it ruled that the EPA had a responsibility to make a determination as to whether or not CO2 was endangering uh, the planet. Uh, and uh, Massachusetts relied upon, in its argument, the danger already existing to the coastline of Massachusetts. And the Supreme Court ruled that the EPA, as a result, has a responsibility to make a decision, which they have yet to do one year later. So your testimony uh, helps to once again dramatize how important the oceans are one year after uh, Massachusetts versus EPA. Massachusetts trying to protect itself against what is happening to its coastline, but to every coastline everywhere on the whole planet. Uh, you are all incredibly important national and international leaders on these issues. Uh, this is one of the most important hearings that we have had. Speaker Pelosi has only created one new committee during her two years as Speaker, and that is this committee on global warming. Uh, and, uh, and I think that uh, if for no other reason, uh, the creation of this committee uh, is valuable because we had this hearing today with the witnesses that we've had testify before us. Uh, we thank you all. With that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.